All right, welcome to uh, the class entitled Top Sins and Struggle, Top 10 Sins and Struggles. This is lesson number one of that uh, particular series. And uh, just, uh, I think people live in the class here uh, kind of understand what's going on, but uh, for those who may be listening you know, online or on video later on, I need to explain to those viewers exactly how we got to this point. So, uh, I've distributed surveys that listed possible sins and personal struggles that many people in the church um, experience in order to get a little bit of feedback from the congregation itself concerning the things that this group has. I've done this many times in the past. We've done it here as, as uh, well. Well, the good news, you know, and I got back you know, quite a few, the, the, the good news is twofold. First of all, we had a great response uh, about these surveys. A lot of people filled them out and handed them back in. And when you're doing a survey or a sampling you know, to try to get a trend or something like that, you've got to get you know, five, seven percent of, of the group at least to kind of you know, figure out if there's some areas, you know, uh, matching areas. Well, we got way over 15% of the entire congregation that filled them out and handed them, uh, handed them in. So that's a great sampling. Uh, and the way it works is that eventually, you know, if you've got 20 choices and people start picking choices, after a while, you know, if it's uh, number four choice, number four choice starts to have six, seven, eight people, nine people, you know, and uh, you could take 40% sampling and number four would simply just get bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, so it kind of repeats itself. That's why I want to say we got a, a pretty good sampling uh, to establish uh, an, accurate, you know, an accurate picture of some of the things that this particular congregation uh, feels that um, uh, individuals in this congregation feel that you know, these are things that we struggle with, you know, not made up things, things that we struggle with. So that's the, the first good news. Uh, we had a good sampling. The, the, the second piece of good news is you're not alone. You're not alone. No matter what it is, if you happen to feel like people in this class, no matter what it is that you checked off, somebody else did too. It's not like you know, a particular sin, you know, only one lonely individual checked off. You know? No matter uh, how bad it seems, how embarrassing it might be, you're, you're all, <clears throat> you know, everybody has a partner or two or three or four that checked off the same particular problem or the same struggle. And you know, the, you know how you kind of find comfort in the idea when you do something like this and someone says, you too, you have, you, you, you have that problem or you struggle with that issue, well, so do I. Uh, I notice I'm not alone in this. So you're not alone. Whatever you checked off, I guarantee you other people checked off the same kind of things. So as far as the uh, top 10 uh, sins and struggles, uh, I'm going to do them in reverse order like a top 10 list. You know, we're going to start with 10 and we're going to work our way down throughout the weeks to the number one uh, uh, struggle and I'm going to try not to give it away um, uh, before we actually get there. So number 10 uh, is laziness. Laziness came in at number 10. Now, I had a lot of you know, sins and struggles. I had more than 10 sin or struggles listed on the survey sheet. But there were a lot of them, you know, the number the, of people who checked off that particular issue was so insignificant, it, it made no difference. And then there are other issues that a whole bunch of people you know, ticked off. Almost every second or third sheet had that as an issue or a problem. So coming in at number 10 was the problem of laziness. So that's the one we're going to start with uh, this evening. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you happen to put that down. You know, I'm not going to do that. Let's read the scripture here. Surprising uh, to note that the scripture, the very first line in scripture is, the, is a line that deals with laziness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
You see my point? From the very first view we have of God, we see Him doing something. He's working, He's creating the universe. Let's keep going. Genesis 1, verse 27, 28. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So in the first contact that God has with man, we see God giving man his first command. And his first command is to work. Produce society, manage creation. That's work, that's effort, that's doing something. I want you to note that the command to work seems to have come before the command against eating of the forbidden fruit. And so what to do came before what not to do. And I'll show you the relationship between the two in the, uh, in the garden scenario. So we see that from the very beginning, God has required mankind to spend energy in work of one kind or another. Even after the fall, God repeated His command that Adam must work, in, you know, Genesis 3.17, except that now, because of sin, His work would be less productive and more difficult than before. So it wasn't a new command. You know, some, I've heard some people say, well, you know, after the fall, God made man, you know, he had to work. No, 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 no. He had to work before the fall. It's just that now after the fall, that work is going to be a lot more difficult and a lot less productive. It's interesting to note that neither Adam nor Eve were busy at the time of the temptation. They were not together, first of all. They had been charged to be working together to manage the creation. That was the work. And for some reason they were apart. And they weren't busy doing what they should be doing. So there's a lesson there, right? What is it? Idle hands, the devil's workshop, you know, ancient wisdom, but certainly biblical wisdom. So God has always expected man to work and not to want to work is a sign of the sin of laziness. And that's my point. As I mentioned, this sin was the 10th most difficult problem that people listed in the congregational survey. So let's start a description of the lazy person, shall we? <coughs> Excuse me. The dictionary describes laziness or the lazy person in this way, not a Bible dictionary, just an ordinary dictionary. It says, one who does not like to work, one who finds activity or effort distasteful. So let's examine this definition. It says, does not like that which requires physical or mental effort, what we normally call work. And the question is, why? Well, some of the reasons, one, immaturity. This person would rather play than work. Some people play and call it work, thereby hiding their laziness in play activities. Or they choose to do what requires the least amount of effort. Why lazy? Another reason, selfish. You know, physical and mental effort requires the giving of self and a lazy person is basically a selfish person. You know, this is a real problem. A lazy person loves himself too much to give away any of himself away in work or in service. Another point in the definition of laziness here, uh, loves idleness, loves idleness. Lazy people love inactivity. Sleep, again, I'm not against sleep, obviously, but lazy people, they just love to lounge. They love entertainment more than work. Anything that requires effort or the pain of giving is negative in their experience. 
Their happiness comes from self-indulgence and easy diversion rather than the satisfaction of accomplishment or effort or service. If you notice, Jesus never you know, went around and said to his disciples, now you go and make sure you entertain yourselves. <laughs> Why? Well, because he knew they knew how to do that. The part that's hard is you go and do this work, you serve this thing, you build that, whatever. Preach the gospel to the whole world, that's work. Entertain yourselves, oh yeah. Man knows how to do that part. Doesn't need a command from God on that deal. Some might say that it's their life, you know, it's my life, and if I, I, I can be lazy if I want to be lazy. That's the way I am, period. You have to deal with it. But the Bible paints another picture of laziness and the true character of the lazy person in God's eyes. So here, you know, we were just looking at uh, the dictionary definition and a couple of possible psychological reasons why a person uh, has a bent towards lazy behavior. Let's look at what the Bible says about laziness, because the Bible, the Bible doesn't talk about laziness as an objective thing over there as a subject. The Bible talks about lazy people. It describes people who are lazy and what they're like, so that we, all of us, are able to see in a person ourselves, a mirror of ourselves, if that happens to be an issue for us. And so what does the Bible say about laziness? Well, the Bible describes a lazy person as being wasteful. Proverbs 18, 9, it says, he also who is slack in his work, lazy, is brother to him who destroys, Proverbs 18, 9. He wastes his time, he wastes his energy, talent, opportunities by not using or underusing or improperly using those gifts. You know, lazy people often invest into things which are not really work, just time fillers. Remember, they avoid work and replace it with activity that they like. I, a perfect example of this is a clerk. When I worked, before I went into preaching, I worked for different companies and I worked for a company called Bristol Myers. And I was the service manager for Bristol Myers in the office. And I had a, a girl that worked, a young woman that worked in our department. And um, uh, uh, she would fill her day with busy work to, in, to avoid the actual work that she had to do. Uh, she would clean her, first thing, in the, she would clean her desk, coming in, you know, put a, go sharpen her pencils and do her thing, go to the stationery, get a little more paper, you know put lead in her thing, I mean really, busy. I could see, from my, I could see her cubicle. Um, she would put her stationery in order, uh, talk on the phone to her mother, get that morning call to mom. Um, long breaks, you know, her, <laughs> her break routine was amazing. You know. 15 minutes before the break, she'd go to the bathroom. You know, freshen up the makeup, do her business, so on and so forth, a little brush, the makeup. And then she would come back to her desk and ding, oh, it's break time. Then she would go on her break and come back. You know, we had 20 minutes, you know, because the cafeteria was a couple of flights down, so it took time to get to the cafeteria, get a coffee, sit down, chat, chat. So, you know, she'd always be late. And then what did she do when she came back? Well, she had to go back to the bathroom and refix the makeup, maybe take a call. Um, she would have, uh, she would write her birthday cards, her thing, her shopping lists. In the afternoon, it was her sister that she called. In other words, you know, if I clocked her, it, it was incredible. She had her, her day scheduled with these type of things so she could avoid as much as possible the real work that she had to do. Well, she uh, was insulted, believe it or not, when asked to do more. You know, we want more production, and she requested an assistant. <laughs> I'm serious, this is a true story. Of course, she was fired eventually because of her laziness. Her laziness caused her to waste the company's time and money. 
You know, lazy people are not just a burden to themselves, they're a burden to other people because they waste other people's time. They waste other people's energy and money. What she wasn't doing, the other girls or guys who worked in there, they had to pick up the slack, they had to get the extra telephone call, they had to go for the, the, the general manager, they had to go down to the file room and find some uh, orders or whatever, delayed orders or whatever, they had to do it. You know, yeah, 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 mom, just a minute, mom, I can't now, you wanna, you wanna go run down and get that for me, you know? Okay, mom, you were saying? I mean, they are a burden to others because others have to work harder to make up for their laziness. So a lazy person is wasteful, the Bible says. Lazy person full of excuses. The sluggard, I love that, the sluggard, <laughs> oh man. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. A lion is in the open square. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. Wow, the imagery, you know, the door turning on its hinges. The sluggard in his bed, he turns one way, freshens up his pillow, turns the other way, freshens up his pillow. It's wonderful imagery there, used. See, a lazy person is an expert at making excuses. Why things should be done tomorrow, why things are not finished, why things are too hard, too far, too complicated, too much. The reason why a lazy person doesn't succeed is always, always somebody else's fault or something else's fault. Usually the lazy ones end up using all of their energy being jealous of others who succeed because they think it's their fault that they're not getting anywhere. I should have gotten that promotion. You know? Well, pff, be a, it'll be a cold day in this office when I'll do any overtime, I want to tell you. I should have gotten that promotion. For the lazy person, an obstacle is something which will provide you with an excuse to avoid an effort of some kind. For a diligent person, an obstacle is something that forces you to figure out another way of getting the job done. But for a lazy person, an obstacle is just, an, you know, I've just got the built-in reason why I'm not going to get this finished. One more thing the Bible says about laziness. Lazy people are wise in their own eyes. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give a discreet answer. I love that one too. So lazy people, you know, you ever notice they know everything? They know all of the answers. You can't tell them anything. You can't show them anything. But the truth of the matter is that lazy people avoid two things at all costs. Effort, truth. Effort and truth. It's a vicious cycle. If they admit the truth, that their problem is laziness, they will have to work, make an effort. And they don't like making an effort, so we're back at square one. So the most effort they make is that they avoid the truth. All right, so you know, the Bible says other things, but I think we're getting the picture here, okay? So there's a danger you know, someone says, so what? You know, that's their problem. What's the danger? You know, sins are sins because they can harm us in some way or another. And laziness, laziness is not a struggle. You know, my mom died and I'm just struggling with the grief. Okay, that's a struggle. I'm struggling with, you know, depression or that's a struggle. Laziness is not a struggle. Laziness is a sin. That's why it's called the top 10 sins and struggles. We'll get to struggles you know, in weeks to come, but for now, number 10, as far as votes are concerned, laziness, number 10. So laziness presents a real danger to those who struggle with this sin. So it may be a struggle in that sense. What are the dangers? More biblical dangers. Well, first of all, laziness leads to poverty. Laziness casts into a deep sleep and an idle man will suffer hunger. 
Not just physical poverty, but emotional and spiritual poverty as well. You know, lazy people who make no effort for physical things, they will not do it for emotional things or spiritual things as well. If a guy is lazy at work, he'll be lazy at church and be lazy in their marriage, their relationship. Because relationships, you know, they require effort. You got to work at a relationship. And if you don't like work, well, Secondly, laziness leads to shame. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. A disordered life caused by laziness brings shame on those who depend on you. Those things that bring honor to a person, all of them come with effort. A distaste of making an effort brings the opposite. It brings shame. A third thing, laziness leads to dissatisfaction. And this is, I think this is like, this is the one that eats you up from the inside. This one right here. The soul of the slugger craves and gets nothing. But the soul of the diligent is made fat. You know, eventually one's laziness robs that person of the many joys in life that other people have. And so lazy people who don't acknowledge the truth grow envious of others and depressed about their own condition. I mean, when you're your own worst enemy because of laziness and you see others around you succeeding, and finding joy and so on and so forth, and you're not getting any of that, because you're not reaching out to take it, to work for it, all you have left is to crave, is to lust after it, is to be jealous, is to be resentful to other people. Isn't it amazing the, the relationship between resentfulness or resentment and laziness? You meet, you meet people who are really lazy, if you, if you know them at all, and they're really lazy, and you just scratch the surface and you'll find a person who is often resentful about life, about other people, got nothing good to say about anybody else. To me, this is the, this is the most painful thing that a person who is lazy will suffer. Um, the Bible says, laziness leads to slavery. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. So lazy people still want things, but they become indebted to other people in order to get those things. Very sad. You see it, it takes no effort to create debt. I think we all have learned that lesson. <laughs> it, it, especially in this day and age, where you don't even have to make the effort to get out of your house, get into your car, or you know, take the bus or something, and go to Walmart or go to the mall and look around and find something and try it on. You know, I mean, that requires effort. So at least your laziness protects you. It keeps you at home, right? But today, are you kidding me? Go online, Amazon, woo. Hmm, you know, red shoes, you know, or, <laughs> you know, whatever. Hunting rifle, this, that, whatever. It's, it's so easy, and then you see what it is. Well, let me see a video, let me see how that works, and they show you how it works, and the delivery's free, I'm saving money. <laughs> Just click. You're the proud owner of a whatever. And so shopping without any effort and easy credit, oh my goodness. That's Armageddon for the lazy person. I mean, that's hell on earth for the lazy person. So, not all poor people are lazy, for sure. But most lazy people end up being poor, financially, emotionally, spiritually. They end up being unsatisfied and slaves to someone or something else. And this is not somebody else's fault. And this is not bad luck. And it is not lack of opportunity or lack of talent. It's just laziness. It's just laziness. All right, so it's easy to, you know, again, it's easy to call something out. It's easy to find the, the negatives, you know, the failings. Very easy thing to do. But how do you deal with it? 
Because obviously if, if people put down that thing, you know, it, it came in at number 10 on our list, obviously people struggle with that thing. You know, nobody's 100% lazy. You know, I, you know, I'm presenting it to you so with, with large contrasts there so you can see it. But people struggle with that. And sometimes more during a certain time of year than another time of year. They just can't, they can't get it going. So how do you deal with it? Enough about the sin itself. How do we deal with laziness? As I said, nobody's 100% lazy. It's one of many sins that we all have to deal with at one time or another. Some are more prone to this sin, just as some are more prone to anger, for example, or sexual sins and so on and so forth. Okay, how do we, how do we get a handle on this thing? Because that's what this class is about, not just naming the sins, but it's, you know, let's get some strategies. How do we deal with this stuff? Okay, number one, acknowledge the truth. That's pretty much number one for any sin but especially for this sin, because the problem with this sin is with, without seeing yourself, you can never get out of it. If we say that we have no sin, John says, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the hardest step for any sin, to actually admit that this one is true for us. Nothing that you need to help you change will come to you or be given to you if you do not confess your fault and your need. And this is what John is saying here. If we say that we have, he doesn't mean if we say we have no sin, like no sin at all, but a particular deny this issue in our lives, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The truth that we are Christians, that we're faithfully following Christ. A follower of Christ doesn't deny that he or she has a sin issue. But if he says, if he, we confess our sins, he, meaning God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The forgiveness for the sin itself and all that it has caused, plus the power to overcome it, begins here. Uh, we could take laziness out and put uh, alcohol abuse in the slot. And number one that would be the number one step, acknowledge it. It's just, it's usually a different process of acknowledgement, you know what I'm saying? But it's always to step into the light and say, you know what, this is a real issue with me. Number two, oh, number two, repent. Repent. I tell you, Jesus said, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, 5. Once you acknowledge the hard truth about yourself, you can begin to change. People do not usually change because they either don't know, don't believe, or are in denial about the truth concerning themselves. But if you accept that Laziness, for example, really is a sin that you're guilty of. So here are three things that you can actually think and do to bring about a meaningful change. So number one, acknowledge it, absolutely. Number two, repent, make a decision. I'm going to deal with this thing. Okay, okay now what, what, do you, what, you, what, what are the practical things to do? Well, first of all, accept that you have to work. <laughs> you have to work. Paul says, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. I, I, I don't want to talk politics here because we hear so much of it all the time, you know, 24 seven. But I'm in favor of government plans that require able-bodied individuals to serve in some way in order to receive a compensation check from the government. I'm, you know, obviously, uh, we, we are a wealthy nation, and as a wealthy nation, and I still think a very strongly believing nation, it's just that the unbelievers and the wackos, they're the ones that get on TV all the time. But I, I think you know, in churches all around here, there are people meeting to praise God and so on and so forth. I think in a country like this, we ought to have uh, programs that, 
that reach out and help those who are ill or too old or you know, who get mashed up in the system? Absolutely, of course, and we can afford it. The problem is when people who are lazy find a way to plug in to a government that simply begins giving them everything that they need without any return from themselves. And why do I think that? Is that a political idea that I have? Of course not. It's a biblical idea, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. It's just that Paul or the Holy Spirit is more succinct in <coughs> laying out his ideas than some of our politicians. So in two lines, he says everything you need to know. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Well, I tell you, if that was the idea, <laughs> If that was the idea, we'd still be able to take care of the people who need taken care of, but we would sure carve out a lot of the fat where money is being spent for nothing and is simply enabling people to take advantage of the good system that we, that we have. Okay, that sounds just a little too, too political, but uh, that's certainly one way that this scripture can fit into our political thinking that you work, that you make an effort, is God's will for you. You are happier and healthier when you obey His will in this matter. So how do I change? Except the fact that this is the way it is. You need to work. You need to make an effort. I don't just mean you need to have a job nine to five at Pinker or wherever you are. Not that. That in life, things require effort. Like I said, relationships, they require effort. Friendships require effort. Faith issues require effort. You know, uh, uh, having food that the family enjoys, right? Requires effort. You got to shop, you got to cook, you got to find a recipe, you know, you got to try stuff, you know. It requires effort. And in our society, the idea is always Easy and fast. Easy food, fast food. Fast food and easy food. So we have a generation of children growing up and their modus operandi is it's got to be easy and it's got to be fast. <coughs> Secondly, and this is, this is key right here, you, you, if you have a lazy streak in you and you want to put the shock paddles on that lazy streak, here it is. Are you ready? If you don't remember anything, remember this. Do it now. Do it now. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Do not put off until tomorrow what can be reasonably done today. Procrastination is the lazy man's effort at working. You get that? Procrastination that is the work that a lazy person does. He sees the task and makes the effort to put it off until later, promising to work tomorrow. That's as much as an effort that he's going to make. Because the effort is always going to come in the future. And when the future comes, the effort is always rushed, at the last minute, sloppy, full of excuses. So putting off, that's a habit. Procrastination, that's just a nasty habit. That's, you know, if you bite your nails down to the, to, down to the core, you know, that's just a bad habit. You just got to work, you know, get rid of that habit. Procrastination, same thing, it's a habit. It's a habit of response that you picked up somewhere, we pick up somewhere along the way, and it becomes our, our go-to thing. Something comes across our desk or in our field of vision or across our lane of responsibility, and the first instinct is to push it away, kick it down the road, Little things and big things. I've seen marriages fall apart because of procrastination. We need to sit down and talk, honey. Yeah, that's true, we do. Uh, 
uh, well, let's, let's, uh, let, uh, let's do that Saturday. You know, Saturday, the kids will be off, and blah, blah, blah. the kids are going camping, you know. And we'll do it Saturday, okay. <laughs> and then Saturday, so I gotta work overtime. So let's, let's find a time next week. That little old girl, you know, she says, you know what? <laughs> Maybe I just won't be around next week for you to talk to. Yeah, it happens. Putting it off as a habit. It needs, to replace with a, it needs to be replaced with a new habit. And the new habit is doing it now. And doing it now, that's true repentance. You're walking across the living room, right? And there's a bunched up thing on the floor that's just on the floor that ought to be over here on the shelf. And the lazy person will walk by and say, man, I got to get that in a minute here. It keeps on going to the thing, right? You want to repent? Really, you want to repent? You are repenting for sure of laziness. If you're walking through and you see it, step one, oh, oh that thing needs to be over there. Well, I'll get it in a minute. And then, no, I'm going to do it now. Put it over here, put it over here. Because if you can't do that, all right, if you can't do that simple thing, I guarantee you, you won't be able to do, honey, we need to talk. You won't be able to do that. Because if you're not faithful in being able to do things now in little things, then you can't be trusted and you won't have the ability to do it now for big things. Okay. It requires faith to do things now and not wait until the time is right or everything is perfect or, and here's the big one, or I just feel like it. Why don't you do it now? Well, I don't feel like it. And my answer to that is, you don't feel like it? What you're saying to me is, you do not feel like making the effort now. That's what you don't feel like. If it has to be done, do it now. So repentance from laziness means you have to work and you should do things right away as they come up. And then thirdly, I forgot to read that scripture. Let me just read this scripture in Ecclesiastes here before I, uh, I move on to the next one. It says, just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed or whether both of them alike will be good. You don't know, do it now. You don't know how God is going to bless what you do, but He can't bless it if you don't do it. He can't bless you if you put it off till tomorrow. Okay, third thing. Cultivate a Christian attitude about work. Paul says again, 1 Thessalonians, and to make it your ambitious to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. Again, you understand when he says work with your hands, he's not talking about only manual labor is blessed, right? That's not what he's saying. When he says working with your hands, meaning you're responsible for yourself that other people are not working with their hands to take care of you. You're taking care of you with your own hands. That's, that's the point here. So the care for your work and to do it well, or the case rather, for your work and to do it well, is a witness of your faith. The purpose of work is not just to counterbalance laziness or provide for our needs, but also to provide for others in need. Ephesians 4.28. The hardest work we had in Montreal when we first went there, we started a church in a very poor part of the city. Uh, most of the people that lived around there were on welfare and they had been on welfare for, not, for like three generations. We had a grandfather, a son and a grandson. All three of them had never worked. They'd been on welfare. And, and a lot of these cousins and that had become Christians started coming to church. And the hardest sermon for them to hear was, Paul, you know, if they don't work, they don't eat. 
A lot of people fell away at the beginning in this congregation. A lot of people fell away from Christ, from the church, not because of the teaching on you know, sexual purity or faithfulness to church attendance, you know, things like that. No, they fell away because, wait a minute, you mean as a Christian I got to work? And it, like, no, they, they couldn't handle that truth. And many of them just stopped coming to church because of that thing. We need to remember that our work is an offering of service to God, not to men. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service of those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, rather than for men. Then he says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So people without Christ see work as a means to an end. You know, I work to produce wealth and power and comfort and satisfaction. Fair enough. But Solomon says that here on earth, work is man's greatest source of comfort and joy, here on earth, Ecclesiastes 2.24. But for the spiritual man or woman in Christ, work is much more than this. Work, for the Christian, is a witness of an honorable life before society. The problem in the church in Verdun was that people would be coming becoming Christians and seeing these brethren, you know, so what do you do? No, well, I'm on, you know, I'm on welfare. Oh, really, have you had an accident? No. <laughs> oh, have you been ill or something? You have some sort of you know, handicap? No, oh, no, no. I, I'm just not able to find what I like to do. You know? <laughs> I mean, when you see a guy get his welfare check and then go buy a Nintendo game with it and a package of cigarettes, and then show up at church on Sunday, that was not like a great witness for Christ. Our work is also an expression of love for one's family as well as those who are in need, absolutely. You know, some men, they're, they're, they're men of few words, they don't say much, but they're not afraid to work. And they'll work and they'll work overtime so you know, their little girl can take ballet classes. And maybe they're working overtime and they can't go to the ballet class, but they're making sure the money's coming onto the table so that the kids have what they need and mama has what she needs and so on and so forth. You know? Or sometimes it's mama who's working to take care of business. You know? Well, yeah, work is love. Work is love. And work is also a sincere offering of love and service to God in Christ, because we're still under the Genesis thing. You know, multiply, subdue the earth, we're still under that. Except now you know, I manage my little you know, half acre and keep my house clean and you know, try to recycle, you know what I mean? But we're still under that thing. A Christian can, in good conscience, achieve riches and power and satisfaction from work, but realizes that these are the benefits that can come from hard work, but they're not the objectives of work. The objective of work is to witness and to show our love for our loved ones and an offering of service to God. So in conclusion, I've said that laziness is a difficult sin to conquer because it's not just a habit, you know, like smoking for example, it's a character trait. And it's a dangerous sin because it can lead to the ruin of our lives and a loss of faith in God. Change or repentance is difficult. It's slow, it's painful, but it can be done. True repentance, remember, requires admitting the truth, beginning to do today, today's things and not procrastinate, and the change in attitude about work itself to a more Christian view to see it as a witness of faith and act of love an effort at godly service. I think if a person repents in this way, God will bless and reward that person richly for all of the work that they do, no matter how humble it is.